Good morning, all. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our one day workshop on the importance of being Islamic, Shab Ahmed, what is Islam and the future of Islamic studies. My name is uh, Yossi Rappaport. I'm a reader here uh, in Islamic history at the University of Queen Mary. In a recent review of what is Islam, Michael Pregil compared what is Islam to a supermassive celestial body. This dense book, he says, exerts an irresistible attraction and alters the intellectual trajectory of those drawn into its orbit. What is Islam poses difficult questions, and no one in the field can ignore them even if one disagrees with its premises, methods, or conclusions. There will be a lot of disagreement today, but I would add that this eccentric, ambitious book could change the way we conceive of all the disciplines that we consider somehow Islamic. Our workshop today will explore the implications of this book for the very framework of Islamic studies in the UK. This book can lead to new conceptualizations of the fields, but its full implications can only be borne out by dialogue, by dialogue between disciplines that are not sufficiently engaged at the moment, who are not sufficiently talking across Islamic disciplines, and that's why we have brought together today this wonderful group of leading scholars of Islam in the UK to comment, discuss, critique, and explore what is Islam. So we have your experts on the history of Islamic art, Islamic science, Islamic philosophy, Islamic theology, Islamic law, Islamic political movements, and Islamic political thought. But what is this Islamic adjective that we prefix? What does Islamic mean? Should we use it at all? Or is this a false common denominator that tells us very little about our subjects of study? So beyond the discussion of Shahab Ahmed's book today, we could also have a unique opportunity to discuss the basic terms of Islamic studies, broadly conceived. It's an opportunity to justify Islamic studies, to justify the coherence of the study of Islam, as Shahab Ahmad says, the importance of being Islamic. The significance of what is Islam has already been recognized in the US, where there have been already two symposia dedicated to the book. Uh, but this is the first event of this kind in Britain. It's not only open to the public, but is also recorded by Gary here, and will be put online, allowing widespread dissemination. We are, I think, acutely aware that the questions posed today matter beyond the academia. What is Islam was published posthumously, shortly after the timely untimely death of its author, Sha'ab Ahmed of Khamsa. This fact will inevitably, inevitably hover over our proceedings today. On a personal note, Shahab was a colleague and a friend, and his passing has been a personal loss as well as a loss to the field. I want, however, to emphasize that our workshop today is not a memorial, but a critical assessment of an important book, Shahab wouldn't have it otherwise. <coughs> Before we start, I would like to express my thanks to the following people and institutions. Uh, this workshop uh, would not have been possible without a grant from the British Association of Islamic Studies, who have also led the publicity to this event uh, and have been continuously supportive. They are very well uh, represented here today. Actually, not yet. I don't think they woke up yet. Uh, generous funding has also come from the School of History uh, here at Queen Mary. I would like to thank Mosmi Bumwick, who welcomed you, uh, and from the Faculty of History at the University of Oxford. Princeton University Press, the publishers, 
have supported us by free copies of the book uh, to the speakers as well as contributed to our reception at the end of the proceedings today. Uh, the idea for this workshop came from a friend of Shehab, a non-academic friend of Shehab, Moin Lashari, whom I met briefly 12 years ago. And he contacted me two months after Shehab's death and told me, you need to do this. Uh, so I actually would like to mention, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have uh, occurred to me to do that without his, his intervention just as a per very personal uh, uh, intervention. Uh, I would like um, to thank uh, Shahab's sister, Shahala, who's uh, come here today and will speak after lunch briefly about Shahab. Uh, I would like to thank uh, John Paul Gabriel, who has helped uh, organizing and setting it up, and very much uh, Shahab's widow, uh, Noah Lesserson, who has been involved from the start and couldn't be here uh, today. I would like now ask, uh, to ask uh, Julian Jackson, the head of school for, uh, uh, of history, to uh, say a few words. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Julian Jackson. I'm, I'm head of the School of History at Queen Mary here. And literally, I'm going to speak for just two minutes because there's nothing worse when you're all, when people want to get into a conference that some, you know, dignitary gets up and speaks for half an hour. So I just want, uh, I am actually a historian of, of, of modern France, uh, and therefore no way an, ex an expert on this subject. I will try and stay for some of the sessions because as a historian of France, I mean, someone who sat through the grotesque presidential debate last night, um, the, uh, which I watched from beginning to end, uh, you know, the word Islam has become toxic in France, and for someone like me, to have any ways of language in which I can talk to my French colleagues about the subject would be very welcome. So I have an interest in this, even if I'm in no way a historian of the subject. Um, I'm delighted for at the School of History, when Yossi asked for backing for this, we were extremely enthusiastic to do this because we are um, we have we are very much going in in our in, in our um, new colleagues who are bringing into the department into the area of global history, but also where Queen Mary is situated. The the extraordinary ethnic diversity of our students makes this a very very uh, appropriate place for what I hadn't realised was the first workshop in. Uh, Britain till on, on the subject of this book. Now, as I say, I'm in no way an expert on this subject, but like anybody interested in the world, I've read many reviews of the book. I remember reading them, and I have to admit that I, I, I think I read about, I remember reading one in the LRB soon uh, after it came out, and I've certainly read two more, and I admit that after reading them, I had no, I could not understand what the book was saying. I have to admit that. I, no, I remember. The only thing I remember remembering was what it said about Islam and alcohol. I particularly, I don't know, perhaps that tells you something about me. I remember that particularly. Um, but I have to admit that I found it fantastically elusive, the accounts of the book. So um, I hope that in, I, I can't stay all day because being head of school involves lots of things to do, but I'm certainly going to stay for the first session. And I hope in that first session, somebody will enlighten me. So I welcome you to hear here all today, and I hope that you have a very productive day. Thank you very much. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, I'm John Paul Gabriel. I'm a member of the history faculty at Oxford, um, and I'm the chair of the first session. Um, <clears throat> so the first session is meant to be introductory, um, but, but I just wanted to mention one thing, because uh, this is probably the session that might blur the lines between the personal and the academic a bit more than some of the other sessions. Um, and that's because uh, everyone on this session has either collaborated with or studied with Shahab Ahmed at some point in their lives. So by way of introducing uh, the two speakers, let me say that I have, I have two books in front of me. One is the, the heavy book that you know, What is Islam? Um, but before What is Islam, there was, uh, I, I think this is Shahab's first book that he, would, he was linked with. Um, and this is a book uh, edited by Yossi Rappaport and Shahab Ahmed. Uh, the title is Ibn Taymiyyah and His Times. It was published in 2010. Um, <clears throat> and like every good book, this, this book has a good story behind it. Um, so back in 2005, Michael Cook, who had been awarded a grant from the Mellon Foundation, uh, invited Yossi and Shahab to come back to Princeton uh, to teach a course on Ibn Taymiyyah, which is somewhat of a poison chalice maybe, I don't know. Um, 
And it was a, a small course. There was there was seven of us, I, myself included. Sort of thought of ourselves a bit like Seven Sleepers of Ephesus. Um, that made me the shock of the amount of reading that Shahab and Yossi assigned to us one week after the other. Um, and I think, in a sense, that that course foreshadowed the weight and length of this book because we were assigned something like 200 to 300 pages of Arabic every week. And uh, but but in typical fashion, uh, Shahab and Yossi expected that we had finished it all uh, from one section to the next. I don't know if we ever fooled them, fooled them or not. Um, but the, the, the class culminated with a conference on Ibn Taymiyyah and his times, which, um, as all, all of you will know, sometimes have experiences of conferences that you never forget. Um, and certainly as a graduate student, um, there, there are some people uh, here with us today, John Hoover, and others who were involved in, in that conference and, and, and present there. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things I remember at the time, it being an incredibly intellectually stimulating uh, set of papers and talks, really unforgettable in many ways, much like this experience one gets, whether we make sense of it or not, in reading what is Islam. Um, and I think, in a sense, a lot of the questions posed in this book about Ibn Taymiyyah, um, the theologian or jurist, uh, Puritan or polemic, uh, I mean, all of these, these contradictions very much capture the set, of, the set of core questions that we see running through what is Islam, I mean, the concern about contradictions within, within Islam. Um, so the book was published in, in, in 2010, um, and I, I, would, I would pass around my, my copy, but it was actually a wedding gift uh, from, from Yossi. I, mean, I think, I, 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 I think I'm, I'm, I'd, like, I'd like to think I'm probably the only person in, in the world to ever receive a book about Ibn as, as a wedding gift. Um, but that's exactly the sort of co contradiction, if we think it is one, that, that would have you know, uh, animated uh, Shahab's writing and, and animated so much of the, 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 the episodes and the anecdotes that he, that he takes up in, in, in the book. Um, so Yossi Rapport, uh, as you, well, you know who he is, and he's, he's here, he's, he'll be our first speaker. And our second speaker is Nenad Filopovic, um, who, who I also first encountered at a, at a conference where um, Shahab was present, but not present in a sense, because they had both co-authored a paper together. Uh, this was many years ago at an Institute for Advanced Study conference organized by Patricia Krona and Jonathan Israel, if I remember correctly, on free thinking traditions within Islam and early modern Europe. We were trying to connect the dots. Somehow, I'm not sure if we did in the end, but we were trying to connect the dots there. Um, now, Nanad's uh, work is known certainly among Ottomanists. Um, Nanad and Shahab actually collaborated on, on an article on the curriculum of imperial madrasas in the 16th century, uh, an article called Sultan's, uh, The Sultan's Syllabus. Um, which, which many of you will know, <clears throat> but you will also, any readers of What is Islam will, will have also encountered Anad's name all across the pages of, of this book, because at the same time that Shahab was writing What is Islam, he was also collaborating very closely with uh, Nanad on another book, another book project, uh, the title of which is uh, Neither Paradise Nor Hellfire, Seeing Islam Through the Ottomans and Seeing the Ottomans Through Islam. And I understand that that book, too, is forthcoming, um, and, and you can talk to Nanad about that uh, at some point later in the day. Um, so, very happy to, to, to chair this session. I think what we'll do is we'll have uh, both of our speakers present for about 15 or so minutes, and then we will uh, open up to discussion. So, first is Yossi Rappaport. Um, yeah, so, where's Julian? Um, Julian, this is for you. So, this session is now, this my lecture talk is just to give a reader's digest of what is Islam. This is my aim in the next 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to um, offer an overly simplified, accessible, I hope, introduction to the 600 uh, page dense book with slides. Shahab wouldn't have approved of this, I can tell you. But we mere mortals sometimes have to do things that we have to do, uh, uh, and this is. And I want to. So I, I don't have. Uh, I'm really going to go through what I think are the fundamental arguments and argumentations without uh, much uh, critique uh, here. Um, first, the aim of the book, given the title, "What is Islam." The aim of the book is not to say this is how you should practice Islam. 
this is not how to find your way to salvation. It is a historical question at its heart, at least the way I see it as a historian. The historical phenomenon of Islam, what Islam has actually been as a matter of human fact in history. The question is not normative but historical. And it starts with six questions that I want to emphasize are about the evidence coming to us from Muslim societies from the Balkan, where Nenad is sort of based, and to Bengal. The evidence of these societies it, it is about uh, uh, what we see coming from these societies in the archives, in the manuscripts. And it has six questions. One, what is Islamic about Islamic philosophy? Where, as Ibn Sina articulated, Quranic revelation is really for the masses. True, the divine truth can only be known by reason. Second question concerned the literature concerning the friends of God, the awliya, who claim experience of intimacy with the divine that is a higher truth from the norms of the Sharia and this intimacy always shows God as somewhat imperfect when you look at God so close. The third question is how, what is Islamic about the very powerful philosophy of illumination where all being is emanation from divine light that is borders explicitly on pantheism. What is Islamic about the most cited, read, copied book of poetry <coughs> in this complex between 350 and 1850, the divine of Hafez of Shiraz in Persian? A book about love, erotic love of boys and girls, of wine, of disparaging attitudes towards ritual piety, or at least ambiguity. What is Islamic about this book that has been read everywhere in all these places? What is Islamic about the figural art of Be'ezad? and all the tens of thousands of illuminations of books of history and fiction and poetry of Hafez, for example, where figural art is valorized as capturing the essence of beings or being recreating the essence of creation or paralleling creation. And what is Islamic about drinking wine? Which is in poetry, in art, in all sorts of discourses, intellectual, but also social practice, is, as Shahab says, the preeminent and pivotal image for the deepest experience of the meaning of the relation to the divine. The question is, how could explorations of wine prohibited by Islam figure out explicitly prohibited by the hadith in Islam pantheism, erotic love philosophy in the Avicinian formulation how could they be both prohibited by law and so highly valorized and disseminated how are they Islamic? Are they Islamic? Should we call them Islamic? And if so, in what way? What does it mean? The image on the co cover uh, of the book, on the title, a coin issued by Jahangir in 1611. Is this an Islamic coin? Shahab says it's not only an Islamic coin because it is issued 
by the ruler of the state that had the largest Muslim population of the time, a state that is legitimized by Islam, a ruler that is a, a functions as an Islamic ruler. It is Islamic because Jahangir is drinking wine and he's drinking wine is Islamic wine drink. That's the point. That it refers to traditions of interpretation that see wine drinking, this image, having an image, a figural art, as part of the engagement with divine revelation. That's that. You may not agree, but that's Shiam's argument. This is an Islamic coin in, in more than one sense. Part two of this book, Shahab does what he did very good, try to demolish everyone uh, else's uh, theory. It's a long part, I'll summarize here, the two main arguments that he demolishes. The first one is the one that I hear in my undergraduate classes. Some of my undergraduate students uh, are actually here today. When students are encountered with these contradictions, they tend to say there is core Islam and there is culture. That's whatever it doesn't fit with Islamic law or the norms that we're used to is culture. There is a core Islam and there are local or peripheral or cultural variations. Now this argument falls on three three obstacles. One, to emphasize again, wine, love, pantheism, philosophy are not marginal in the evidence. They were read everywhere. And Menad can say more about the curricula in which we find this. They were read everywhere. They formed the identity of the literate classes from the Bank, from Bengal to, to the Balkans. These traditions are not local. Jahangir is not issuing this coin because this is Indian tr local tradition. It's issuing this coin in relation to a universally Islamic tradition. And finally, these are not secular discourses. They are not outside the engagement with the divine. They use the vocabulary, drinking wine, the poetry of love of Hafez, is about engaging with Quranic vocabulary. It's not outside of it. The friends of God are of course referring to the Quran and the Hadith. So this is not separate from any core Islam. The second, the second approach is the one that is usually found in academia, where academics say faced with this problem, they say there is no one, there is no Islam. There are many Islams, there is endless diversity. Or whatever Muslims do and say that Islam is, is Islam. That doesn't solve the problem. What makes all the different Islams Islam? What makes a Muslim Muslim? And Shahab startlingly argues something that many academics find hard to swallow. He says Islam exists as a reality outside of individuals. Islam exists outside of individuals as a reality outside that he says every Muslim feels in her or her, uh, in her or himself that there is something outside of Islam. So what is the solution? The solution tries to capture the paradox and the diversity and the plurality, but also giving unity. Something can be called Islamic when it comes from any type of engagement, poetic, artistic, legal, theological jokes, with the text of the revelation. The hidden reality without the text. This is the explicit aim of the philosophers and the Sufis to find the hidden reality behind the text. 
but in a way it's assumed by everyone that there is some kind, something beyond the text of the Quran and the Hadith. And engaging with the vast accumulation of the way previous Muslims have engaged with this text and pretext. So Shahab coins these terms text, pretext and its hidden reality and context. And he then says, but it has to have the aim of me making meaning for oneself. The point of saying that is, it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's not just an intellectual exercise. It's an attempt to define yourself towards God or to, to define the self. Um, the formula is pretext, understanding God behind the text, the text itself, and the reservoir of all different interpretations that have gone so far. In a way, Shahabs at some point understands that what he is offering is not applicable only to Islam. And reviewers of all them that it could be what is Judaism, what is Christianity. Shahab makes here a clever move by saying, perhaps, but I'm coming to this by observing Islam. I'm not imposing something from outside. It's reversing the colonial encounter of knowledge. I'm not imposing something from outside. This is my observation of Islam, I come to it from it. If you, in Jewish studies, Christian studies, other religious studies want to take it up, fine. But he also says Islam is distinct because of the questions he posed at the beginning. That the paradoxes, these contradictions, are more powerful in Islam than they are in other things. That God is a puzzle local insight on this. Uh, poetry in uh, Shab's articulation of the poetry of the way of Islam is the religion of love and poetry is very very beautiful in my view. So it's the contradiction, the paradox, and the metaphor that usually and often make something Islam. And this paradox is managed by spatial hierarchy in which private elites, literate, explore and imagine in a private sphere, in a higher sphere, while in the public sphere, legal norms uh, are more dominant. He clearly thinks here of drinking wine, yeah. but that's the method, that's the signal he has. And I'm sure more will be said about this separation of uh, today. <coughs> what are the implications of his argument? One is something that academics have said before, but he's saying it more forcefully, I think. There is no pure, you can't look in the past for something pure that is, this is Islam or something else is syncretic or a later addition or a periphery. He refuses to accept syncretism. It's, it refuses to accept that every interpretation of Islam, every time you speak Islamically, as he says, you are doing Islam. He places and does it beautifully here. The poetic, the artistic, the imaginative at the center, or at least at the same value as the legal. And he places Persian literature especially and Southeast Asia on par with the Arabic and the Middle East. And he says, finally, I think something that is perhaps the most difficult is paradox is not the problem, but rather the solution. When we find paradox, this is, ah, we, we've reached the right, it means that we got it. Um, I'm sure uh, my fellow Palinists today will disagree with the, uh, will present the book differently, uh, find different things or disagree with my, uh, some of the ways and definitely critique uh, this book. Um, what I'm offering is really uh, a reader's uh, digest 
Um, I want to say also that I don't have any insiders inside. Uh, I'm, uh, I wasn't close to Shihab in the time this book was formed, and I think Nenad, who will follow me, will have more to say on the way this book has been formed. I want to um, end with this small personal touch, saying, one, that this book I want to mention to the contributions of Nenad to this book, but also of uh, Shahab's uh, first wife, Dana Sajdi, whose intellectual debates, the intellectual debates they had, and she is a leading historian of Ottoman cultural society, are really, I can see the traces of them in this book, clearly. And secondly, of Nora Lesserson, uh, his widow, who unlocked something in Shehab and allowed him to articulate, to, to open up and put on paper these ideas that have been percolating uh, for so long. And uh, the contributions of this, uh, of Dana and Noah, are really important the way I read the book and in Shehab. So, final, uh, final story. Uh, about uh, Shehab from the classroom. There, are, there were a lot of good stories from our classroom. Um, and, um, but one that actually I wasn't there. This is something I heard on his teaching in Harvard. The first session of the class, a student raised up his hand and said, are you a Muslim? <laughs> Shehab didn't answer. He went to the board and wrote Muhammad Shahab Ahmed and sat down. First of all, it's witty like Shahab was. But also, this comes back to something he has in the book about even the converts to Islam or any how the, even the name and the genealogy constitutes an individual in the terms of Islam. Shahab, at the very least, in that formulation, at Shahab, at the very least, was constituted in Islam by virtue, by the mere virtue of his name. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yossi. Um, well, it's my really great pleasure to now to, to bring up Nenad Filipovic, uh, um, uh, for two reasons. I mean, one, I guess Yossi's already uh, addressed the, the, the point of how closely Nenad was working with, um, with Shahab during the writing of this book. Um, I think the second point is that what's striking to me about the book, as, as someone who focuses mainly on the, the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire, is, is the, the Balkans to Bengal frontier. I mean, the sheer sc scale of um, geography encompassed within what is Islam. And, and I'll say that Nanat comes to us today, at least from the University of Sarajevo. And I think actually a lot of, a lot of his attention, uh, a lot of Shahab's attention to, um, to the Balkans, to this wide issue of space, it comes a second nature to Ottomanists. I mean, we see the world in this way, but for an Islamist to, to actually adopt this in his book is very, very striking. And I think much of this comes through through this uh, very recent uh, collaboration with Nanad, uh, which of course goes back for Yoshi, Nanad, and Shahab back to graduate school. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Uh, nice meeting uh, everybody here, but a special respect to Dr. Shahla Ahmed, uh, Shahab's, what we would say in Sarajevo, Abla, the older sister, uh, who was also very important, I know, from many messages from Shahab and uh, listening to many telephone talks from Istanbul with his mother, Dr. Saida Razia, and uh, Shahla, how actually Shahab all the, all the time shared his research and his thoughts with his family. Also, my respects to Gilat. After many years, we see each other again. And, you know, I don't know to write short papers. 
I wrote 70 pages paper. It's like a Plutarchian paper, a parallel life of Patricia Corona and Shehab Ahmed, and with the main thesis about the obsoleteness of an Orientalist versus anti-Orientalist controversy. But I got so many scaring messages by you see that I will not read it. I have some papers, the, uh, some notes. The Ottomans used to call it Evraki Perishan, the scattered papers, and I will say something from this um, scattered papers. So 2015, and this is the only thing personal I will say, was Anus Horribilis for myself. Uh, on July the 11th, Patricia Krone passed after five years of fighting cancer. And in 2001, I wanted to go to law school. Uh, and Patricia Krone told me it will be a minuscule contribution to legal studies, but a, a huge loss for Ottoman studies. So she was the reason why. She always believed that I'm good. I don't know whether I'm good, but she believed I'm good. and it meant to me that she believed I'm good. And, uh, but this was expected. She was ailing for five years. But Shahab's passing was a, it, it was a terrible loss for me. And um, the title of the conference, The Importance of Being Islamic, is really up to the point. And I believe this is a genuine title of the book. But when you have to deal with Princeton University Press, and when you have to deal with editor who thinks uh, this is not a marketable title, then you get what is Islam, and what is Islam is also a book by W. Montgomery Watt. And having known Shehab and his fear of plagiarism, I don't think that he would be very happy with the title, What is Islam? Um, so this is normally pun on Oscar Wilde, who was very dear to Shehab. But I will not quote from Oscar Wilde. I will quote from another great aestheticist poet, who, unlike Oscar Wilde and like Shehab Ahmed, was a great scholar. This is A. E. Hausman. So in 1921, in the Cambridge Philological Society, um, uh, A. E. Hausman delivered a lecture called The Application of Thought to Textual Criticism. And there is a famous line in that uh, lecture, which I read as Shehab Ahmed Awan Laleta. And it reads as, knowledge is good, method is good, but one thing beyond all others is necessary. And that is to have a head, not a pumpkin on your shoulders, and brains not pudding in your hat. Uh, Shehab liked uh, bread pudding, but he didn't have uh, uh, pudding in his head, obviously. Um, and everybody should agree. Even if you were an intellectual and any kind of disagreement with Shehab, that he has a head, that he had a head on uh, his shoulders, and that he had a brains in his uh, head. Anyway, uh, there is a small but brilliant illustration to that. He, at page 491, what, he, what was really you, one of the unique things with Shehab is page 491, it's an illustration of page 14, 491, footnote 177, the last sentences. I have followed Caldecott, it's a, a very important colonial scholar of Malaya, as well as Wilkinson Dictionary of Malaya, English Malayan Dictionary, in translating Tiang as Pila, its standard meaning in the Malayan Peninsula. Although in the context I was very tempted to understand Tiang to mean human being as in Javanese. And this is an illustration of that special brilliance which was unique and which is just unrepeatable. That's Yossi had the right. You have to be born like Muhammad Shaham Ahmed. 
So let us go back to Princeton in the late 1990s. Um, and I should paraphrase Dostoevsky on Gogol, uh, saying that all of us came out of Michael Cook's cloak. Uh, all of us, meaning Robert Wisnowski, Harry Boone, Adam Sabra, Shehab, Yossi, Roxani, Margarita, Bakitesh, Jan Beh, all the way up to Behnam Sadegi. My poor self somewhere there. Uh, Cook rip, was finishing his magnum opus on Emmer Bilma Aruf and Ehir Anil Munkar, and he was frequently bemoaning a sad fact of non-existence of rich oil Hanafi state. The uh, consequence of this, this Hanafism, Maturidism, is underpublished and understudied, unlike in Orientalism, which is one of the very good sides of Orientalism. I must add to that. Therefore, our understanding of Islam in general and of Islamic thought in particular is impaired. So said Michael Cook, and I agree. Uh, Shehab's book remedies that said fact in a huge deal. However, it remedies that in by now the best possible way. For Hanafism, Maturidism does not get isolated in this book, but it is a part and parcel of the entire phenomenon, and the entire phenomenon is presented in such a way that in a play between law, speculative theology, philosophy, intellectual Sufism, wisdom of practical living is elucidated. There is no better thing than that in existing literature. The book does not claim the only Islam is the Persianate Hanafi Maturidi Islam, but it claims that it provides that the study of Hanafi Maturidi uh, Islam from, let's say, 1258 to 1900 provides um, the best window to see Islam as such due to historical circumstances, I stress historical circumstances, and which are based on the quality of preserved evidence. In no other Islamic pre-modern society you you could find such diverse body of sources that you can actually grasp the realities of human lives of, and human thoughts. And uh, that's what turned Shehab to the Ottomans. And you, you know where he had lived. Longer he obtained the best grammar of Ottoman, which is Jean de Nigramer de la Langue Turc, thousand pages. He adored the grammar because it, was, it respects the Ottoman tradition. So you don't uh, uh, learn in that grammar on accusative, you learn of meful anhu, you learn of meful bihi, and so on and so on. So in two years, he should have become the Ottomanist we would fear of, <laughs> especially his reviews. Um, so, how he shows that? He shows that through this brilliant concept, which is present both in Ottoman world, uh, not both, uh, present in Ottoman world, it's present in Maveran, Neher, and it's present in subcontinent. It's a concept of a sine selas. And, you know, there are two great scholars, unknown, outside of Turkey, Semih, it's a couple, Nuran Tezjan and Semih Tezjan, who are historians of language. And they studied Evliya Celebi's understanding of language. Do I have any time left? 
Oh, okay. So they started, um, and they proved, actually, that Evliya Chelevi understands Elsine Selassie as one language. So he speaks Elsine Selassie as one language, and he thinks that's one language. That's Arabic, Persian, and Ottoman. So he finds that in Mavir Raon Neher as well, and it's subcontinent, meaning Sheha. Oh my goodness, it's already too long. Uh, so, reviewers generally miss the point of the book. So, uh, you know, Malis Rutfen, this, the review which Princeton University Press loves, but it was a terrible review. Um, uh, so, David Nirenberg, it's a very, very clever piece, but he writes all the time about Baghdad to Bengal complex. He doesn't get the main idea of the book, although he understands uh, the importance of that fatwa of Abu Sud, which shows that, you know, Nirenberg's research assistants didn't do a proper job. Um, then um, Bruce Lawrence and uh, Ardent Hodgsonite um, denies the originality of uh, Baghdad, um, oh my goodness, now I'm in Nuremberg, uh, Bengal to, uh, Balkan to Belga, Bengal saying, oh, you have it with Hodgson, with uh, Nile to Axis. Yes, you have it, but it's not historical. It's like Toynbee's civilization. It's just in Hodgson's head. As beautiful as it is, it's not historical. While Balkans to Bengal is historical. Uh, anyway, I had some disagreement with my friend, but I cannot, uh, with some specifically uh, about enlightenment, Talal Asad, but I cannot go into it. I would like to conclude with a quote from a lecture which was given both at Oxford and Cambridge in May 1950 in front of groups of Orientals, uh, Orientalists. It is titled The Muslim Mystics Strive with God. Uh, the author was Helmut Ritter, whose discovery of Meshebi Ishq figures pr prominently in Shehab's book and who is frequently involved in our joint book on the Ottoman Friday Kerai. Ritter said, the Islamic mystics have endeavored also to find an answer to the great question, what is the meaning of creation, of life and death? What is the wisdom behind the pains and afflictions that befall mankind? It is a task of science which deals with man, with his religious feelings, and philosophical ideas to listen to people far off in space and time and to try to understand their ideas. We study these subjects in order to get out of the narrowness of our own world, in order to see how men of other countries and ages have struggled for the solution of problems and endeavored to overcome the troubles, conflicts, and afflictions which mankind has to face and will have to face in every place and at every time. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you very much, Anand. Okay, we have we have a good amount of time for discussion. I'd say about twenty minutes, twenty five minutes or so. Um, so, um, thank you both. Let's start with questions. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to actually go back to the question of the Islamic mystics. Um, I think you mentioned that the Mentioned Talal as a bit passing, so perhaps if I can ask you maybe air some of those disagreements. That was my question too. Your Shehab loves Talal Asad, and I never understood that. 
<laughs> it was so unshehabian, but you know, we all have uh, our sins. <laughs> uh, here is this idea, which is very, very, when he says, you know, Islam, by religion, is a construct of enlightenment. And it is a construct. Uh, colonial construct and da, 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 da. and this is pretty much what entered this, in my opinion, quite detrimental branch of anti-orientalist, postmodernist scholarship. Uh, what Michael Cook would say, postmodernist fog and foam. Uh, uh, so, what? My problem with Talal Assad, and I told that Shahab a couple of times, is that Talal Assad doesn't say what was Christianity before uh, uh, enlightenment, and what was Judaism, just to stay with the monotheist religion, before enlightenment. Were they a religion, a religio strict, uh, sense of strict thought, even before enlightenment, or were they also constructed as religion during enlightenment. Uh, if you go to Marx, I don't know if it's popular anymore to go to Marx. Uh, contribution to Jewish question. And to Hannah Arendt, uh, the first part of origins of totalitarianism, uh, and, uh, on anti part of anti-Semitism, you see the problem where they Marx actually presaged the problem, and Arendt described the problem after the Holocaust. Actually, so-called secularization of the Jews resulted in Holocaust. And Hannah Arendt said the Jews got little as opposed to what they lost when they were, you, you know, uh, a privileged community, a pat patented community of a special uh, uh, So I, I'm wondering whether, uh, you know, enlightenment secularism constructed Judaism also in the same way, but the consequences were, in my opinion, uh, much worse than, uh, than what is the worst uh, form of colonialism. I don't know whether I uh, uh, answered your question. Thank you. Uh, yes, you uh, could you speak up, please, sir? Regarding divine knowledge, so just to rush through it a little bit, you mentioned the two spheres, the private sphere and the public sphere, and you Particularly, I mentioned the public sphere, which is the legal and the literal norms. Yeah, people argue that there's some of that also in the private sphere. So, could you expand on that? Uh, and how do you demarcate what are the criteria for each of those sections? Um, I think this is a. I'm not clear how she has demarcated it exactly. I think what he had in mind is this idea that the exploration of philosophy or the drinking of wine would be something that lit literate elites would do uh, without infringing on the public sphere. He didn't mean, and he makes it very clear, he didn't mean that this is elitist in that all the commoners were following uh, Sharia or, or legal norms. He has a more Broad, a broad understanding of elitists. He says that it's not true that all the peasants who uh, were vote were banks for the Muslim Brotherhood, it's a matter of our centuries, that they don't know that. It's probably not true uh, in their understanding. But the point he's saying is that there is this exploratory, imaginative uh, activities where could take place behind closed doors, either physically or in a discursive sense. I think that's what it is. Uh, 
Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, uh, just a uh, quick uh, question for you. Is that for Yosef or Joseph? Yosef, Yosef. Yes. So, so uh, uh, just a question about the. the, the uh, because like, when we did the chapter, I think I missed the class of what saying that's applicable to other. But just I'm asking, you said to other what? I mean, to other traditions? I'm not sure. Does he use, you know, and for example, the concept of text? Because if he's using, for example, if it's applicable in conceptualization of the text, then we have I mean, a huge problematic issue because all conceptualizers, because then the core is the text, but it's not really that. So I'm just wondering yeah. if you use the term text and you ask the question. I'm actually, like, um, yeah. To be precise, Shahab is definitely saying I'm not putting this for any other. I think it's, it's more playing with what reviewers have come with as well, saying the concept that he's engaging, is, I don't think it's saying it himself. I think this is something that comes out of the book and the reviews. You have your way of engaging with scripture. So you can take the Bible and you can say, well, this is the way that other, the other one the Islamic religions in this. You can think of their religion the world they try to avoid all the time. Judaism and Christianity, can also be what is Judaism, we could apply the same. That I think we could. That was my point. What is Judaism? Yeah, if you say what is Judaism, you say, okay, it's the text of the of the sacred text of Judaism. Yeah, take the text, what if you say what is Judaism? Ah, this is me, not Shah. So Judaism as a category and it's not as a category. No, 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 no. I'm saying if you want to ask what is Judaism, if you want to ask what is Judaism. You could take this formula of pretext, text, and context in the way Shahab has it, and try to play with it as well. That was my point. That was my point. That was my approach. What Shahab actually says very clearly, it says, I'm not borrowing this from which studies, unlike previous. That he makes it, he repeats it again and again. I'm not like saying, okay, this is how we study other religions, but I'm applying it. I'm doing something new. But he's engaging me while the discussion. You're right to point out the imprecision in my presentation. Okay, yes, please. But in this sense, Christianity and Judaism are Islam because they are pretexts, and if you look at the sphere, they are give context. And uh, if you look at certain Islamic novels, you have text to the polemics of answering and so on and so forth. You have many Jews and Christians who worked Islamically with chronicles and blah, blah, blah. So that makes Christianity and Judaism Islamic. <laughs> Shahab says specifically about Maimonides, we should call Maimonides, and in particular, Maimonides is a Muslim Jewish, a Jewish Muslim philosopher. Because everything is there and he's making meaning for himself. And you want, actually, what you're saying is something that maybe, uh, I don't know if Emily wants to, you know, whether Aristotle is Islamic, whether, you know, all these within, not only individuals, but yeah, wonderful. I just say, yeah, great, that's exactly what, yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Just uh, perhaps there is something that uh, Shahab, I mean, to my reading, emphasized is how uh, the history of scholarship and the history of, of Muslims throughout history, of Muslims themselves, is this claim, this predominance of, of the law as the core of <coughs> misunderstanding and, and the law versus all the other approaches to Islam. And this is specifically Islamic, this predominance of the law that is trying to be constructed by showing how the, all these other multiple approaches to Islam are, are, are as powerful as the law and form Islam, not this predominance of the law that historically put uh, the law as the core and as the reference. That's, so this is unique, unique to Islamic history and Islam, I guess. That's what we wanted also to show. Particularly, 
in the perspective of the scholarship, for example, of Islamic studies. So he's trying to build new parameters of knowledge, I guess, by deconstructing the spirit dominance of the law. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Deconstructing the dominance of the law, but I think, and I think you have uh, Nafai and Rob, and uh, well, you have, I think this is critical, the deconstruction of the law is critical to me. Uh, and, and as a legal historian, I can only, you know, I'm losing my train, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's what I want to put, uh, show, which is unique and as a pheno historical phenomenon to Islam. Yes, please. Uh, thank you both for your very engaging talk. Um, when I was revisiting my notes on the book just to prepare for today, I noticed that Shahab Ahmed invokes uh, majorities, and he speaks of demographic majorities and absolute majorities, um, and it's always uh, tied to his valoration of, uh, valorization, sorry, of the Balkans, uh, the Bengal complex. And uh, now he's clearly not making uh, an Islamically, uh, a religiously Islamic intervention with this book. But on the other hand, um, you know, uh, the, the proto Sunni community that he had these, uh, and that Hadith emerged as the villains of the piece to some extent. And there's also this very interesting exclusion of the Arab world. And I wonder if you could uh, comment on that. I think that this is how it comes to me. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, because Yossi looked at me. He gave me an engaging look. Gaze. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you, you know, he, he, he didn't try the comprehensive history of Islam, like 18 volumes. He has a case study. This is a huge, uh, this is not a peripheral case. This is a very important case which opens some new vista. Uh, I think Shahab would be the last uh, to undermine Hadith, being himself a great Hadith scholar. And any time when I have trouble with Hadith, I would always ask Shahab for his fatwa. Uh, <laughs> so it's just too much. For instance, you see Malice Root Runs Free. It's a classical piece how you uh, write about something you don't understand at all. But you you know, Freya Stark was your godmother, and that you are you sell very well, and then London the review and Princeton University print, they like it. So first half of the review is just recalling these pieces by Mohana and, and Feldman and now he says something about okay this guy is from wine that's good They're, let's all Muslims should drink because if they do booze they are good if, and they are good for democracy and then in the end he has to have some he has to have some remark, critical remark and critical remark you know Ismailism is undermined you know, we have such a, you know, foregones of the work on Ismailism. With all due respect, from Massillon to Heinz Howe, this is a great scholarship. But the Hanifism, Maturidism, is an orphan of Islamic studies because it's huge and it's very difficult. You know, it's one thing to study Hadith and it's another thing to study Kitab and Tawfiq by Maturini. You have to know Persian in order to understand his Arabic. And he claims a case for this, and I think he's right. This is the ambition of this book. In the very end, this book emerged as a postface to the study of Ottoman pride and Karai, the people, two strange men. One said, Oh, there is this God, but he's, he's very good, and he created the world, and he forget it. You know, he is not interested in the world, and he was killed in 1600. And there was another guy who was killed in 1665. Uh, he was a great scholar and millionaire, but he had some strange ideas. So they, he used to meet Mr. Wagner, the legatus. The famous Legatus Wagnerianus from Library comes from Wagner, 
And Warner, who used to speak Turkish so wonderfully in 17th century, and what today's Ottomans from the West, so he said to him, but there is. And uh, this guy who got that secretary, he says, yuck, there is no. That was their communication. So this was the guy who taught that there is no God. In 1665, he was an avowed atheist without any connections with the Western atheism. And uh, that's how, uh, you, you know, Shahab, in order to culturally situate this, had to go back to Machu Picchu. And I, I hope I don't speak too much. Tell me, yes, we have one question. I mean, I think the, the important point uh, to add to this or to, 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 to capture here is, is the inception, the conception of the book, in some ways, uh, coming from this problem of a Muslim atheist in 1660s in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And how do you fit someone like this within, a, within a, an understanding of um, being Islamic that is coherent and makes sense? And that's, that's, that's a sort of, uh, the I was referring to another, another, another article, that, that, another work that, that they were doing together. But that's, in, a, in, a sense, in essence, the book comes out of that problem. How do you make sense of this man in 1666 in Istanbul explaining how he is a Muslim in this way to the Dutch ambassador in Istanbul? Uh, yes, please. Uh, this is this is like a comment on uh, why Shahab might uh, why Shahab liked us so much. I think uh, he, he's criticizing Assad as well. It's not you know he's criticizing Assad in the sense that uh, what he likes about him is the idea of discursive. That it's not just the text of the Quran and Hadith which has given rise to Islamic thought, but the way Muslims have engaged with it and the way they have made it their own in their actions and in the thought in different ways Shahab is thinking. What he is critical of is that uh, what Asad does is he limits the discursive tradition to the textual understanding that what has happened through the legal and the uh, theological debates is what hmm. Assad is thinking as discursive. While the wandering thing, while what the hmm. philosophers did, is something which Assad is not taking into consideration. So despite uh, having a concept of discursive tradition, which Assad obviously for into the book, uh, which is very expansive, he limits it to to the textual understanding. So I, I find it a very balanced critique of Assad uh, while he's appreciating it at, at the same time uh, and he's in debt for it. So his own idea of Islam is in debt for it. But at the same time he's making it much more expansive. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No questions? Should we no. Mm -hmm. um, as chair I'll remain quiet. maybe later in the day. Yes, please. Now, on the point that you mentioned about culture, uh, one of the points that uh, Shahab was very keen on was analytical clarity in terms of points that, what well, terms we were discussing, what we discuss when we discuss. So, in part of the book, he replaces the word civilization with culture, and it just ends up meaning the same thing. So, can that argument now be used against him when he comes out with this hermeneutic engagement because of the critiques that are made for, uh, in terms of? Know, what is Judaism, what is, uh, what is Christianity, he ends up kind of mimicking the criticisms that he ha makes earlier on in the course of making this argument. Um, <laughs> no, I, I agree, I agree, but I think that it's a, the, the, it, it, I'm not sure after reading the book, when you see now something, in the text, in the source, you will be able to say whether it's Islamic or not. Even after I, I agree with, I definitely agree with that. Uh, and what, it, especially what is making meaning for oneself, is very difficult. Uh, but it is a look about the self. Uh, All right. In hopes of keeping the schedule uh, to schedule for the rest of the day, let me uh, bring things to a close for now. But let me try to capture just um, three points emerging from our, our conversation so far to carry on throughout the day. Um, I mean, first, 
in our real sense in the book and on our discussion of the way in which the book is seeking to strip the altars of Orientalism. Sense, strip, and, I, and I use a sort of uh, in a metaphor in a sense from the Christian Reformation, I don't know what, what so I would think about that, but in a real sense that, that of, of the book attempting to clear out these accretions within the scholarship. Um, and what does is, what is the book want us to get back to? Um, in a sense, it is history. It is the historical experience of, of Islam um, in all its colors and shapes and sizes. Um, and I think, in a sense, the second point here is that to historians, I mean, to take this point about comparisons to Christianity and Judaism, which I think Yossi quite rightly says, Shahab, you know, is, is rejecting what a sort of theory of religion might offer to any of this. I mean, this is a very, uh, a real concern to, 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 to stay focused on history. Um, of course, historians of Christianity or, or Judaism, certainly in, in, the, in the Catholic context or in the context of early modern Christianity, have talked about heterodoxy and orthodoxy. They've talked about local and global um, micro-practices and how those fit into a macro, a macro narrative. Um, these discussions may feel the same, uh, but I think, of course, again and again, the book is, is taking us back to the fact that it's different because, as Yossi's um, introduction pointed out, uh, A, he's concerned with the historical experience of Islam, and B, these paradoxes seem more present in Islam than they do, say, in the history of Christianity or Judaism. That's an issue that we can debate, and we need more people in the room, in a sense, to, to, to really get that, I mean, different, all, a whole range of people in the room to get that discussion going. Um, the third point is, is a last point. Um, I mean, in a sense, you know, of course, what Shahab is trying to do in the book is, is I think we probably should acknowledge, part of a much longer tradition of exegetical uh, exegesis or, or thinking about the question of what makes a Muslim. Um, and I think he engages with those traditions in their different languages um, throughout the book in different ways, but, but in a sense writes himself into that uh, very long historical tradition of figuring out what it means to be a Muslim, what is a good Muslim, what is a bad Muslim. I mean, these questions are lurking throughout the book and underneath the book. Um, so in a sense, it is very much, I think, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, a scholar who's looking at Orientalism and Orientalist, uh, and Oriental studies, in a sense, um, but also a much deeper trajectory uh, that he's drawing on here. I mean, a much deeper set of traditions that he's pulling into. Very modern, but also uh, really a millennium's worth of, 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 uh, of problems that he's, that he's really engaging with. So, um, I'll, I'll end there. Uh, we have a coffee break outside. We all need coffee at this time of the day. <laughs> we haven't carried our big books here. Um, and we will start again. It's 10.45 now. We'll start again at 11.05. 11.05. Please, back in the room so we can carry on today. Thank you very much for our speaker.